episode of 3D Changes Perspectives. And you're like, always, we got something great for you. But before we get into it, let's go ahead and drop down to the sponsor. Like always, we have RoundlyX.com as a sponsor, sponsoring this entire network, helping this channel grow, help on this episode today. And if you sign up at RoundlyX.com and uses the sign up code Changes Perspectives, get that extra $15 in Bitcoin today. And if you are going to do anything DCMA with your card with RoundlyX.com, it's one of the best features on the site. Get in, let's get going, and let's run that run show. Uh -huh. Wow, I love that intro. Thank you, RoundlyX.com, for helping us get this going. Thank you. Bitcoin Live for helping this episode drop down. Now, I just wanted to go ahead and point out today's episode. I don't have a speech or anything. I kind of wanted to run as like a mystery. And I got a bunch of stuff and got some new stuff going on the screen for you. So you're going to see why we don't have a, a script or anything today. But God, it is a mystery episode. I just want to go what the crypto and show you guys some fun stuff. Something a little bit different, but you're going to learn at the same time like always. So let's go ahead and drop into it. Um, here we go. So very quickly, we're going to start off like, oh, wow, look at that. I have it all set up. I, got, I actually got the uh, the note keeping thing in here for you to make it a little bit easier. Um, and yes, we got Zoom working finally. So basically, when we go into what is encryptions, what is this type of technology, we've talked about the hashings and how they work. And we really need to talk about the encryption. So when we go into what is encryptions, encryption is just hiding data, right? So if we look, there is this piece of paper wrapped around a, a rod. Now, this was like the most common way for a long time of doing encryptions. And it was the size of the rod, the, the, the diameter that made this work. And that's, that's kind of the, the beauty of this type of technology. Like encryptions can be so simple as a bunch of random characters with what you want on a piece of paper you wrap around a rod. Uh, and this kind of actual method people still do use to this day. There's even something called a knot encryption where they do specific knots on rope to show different things like, hey, we are um, going to sell off after dark or we're going to sell off before, you know, dawn or different little things to let people know as they're entering or, or exiting this ship they can look at they can look at certain things and then go okay i know i need to be ready by midnight or i know i need to be ready by the time night falls and for this type of encryption we see the stick this was actually for like hey we need to securely save data we need to get something out to a general during wartime um and that that's the secret about this this was spartan military technology and that's kind of what the whole point of today is it's like the technology of encryptions and we're got we got some fun stuff playing i don't know if you can see all those little tabs but each one of those tabs is something new to look at so when we go down a little bit okay we looked at like romans and we're looking at how they did stuff and they even have you know more other versions but that that scroll with the rod is the best because you can actually have these various different rods throughout all of your encampment but only have one specific size rod that works and then that way if your enemy just picks up one of the rods thinking it any of them might do well then they have to find that one specific one so there's even ways to secure the key so to speak but the medieval cryptography they took it a bit further and there was actually a book of cryptics written in case you don't know what a cryptic is a cryptic is a message that can be written in cryptography and if, if you notice, it's actually called the Book of Cryptic Messages. Um, and basically, all they really did is they just kind of went through and noted, like, every word that could be spelt with and without a vowel. Like, what does it look like? And all of them in order, in some kind of order, like a specific order. And that basically allowed them to decipher messages pretty much on the fly. Like, they would, they would see a set of messages, and they would look at this book, and they would go through it. And they go, oh, right here. And they just basically had a key. And so what we really get from this is some of the original data encryption that's kind of like what we have right now. What they were using was vowels. 
instead the vowels and consonants like right now we use prime numbers and non-prime numbers as our data points you know your analysis non-prime numbers your your actual encryptions prime numbers and they were using vowels as their prime numbers and they were using their consonants as their non-prime numbers and then using them in specific orders allowed you to send messages and now you know honestly when i first heard about this i was like bro has anyone done this in the english language and it turns out that people had done this in the english language all the way back as like the um gosh i think it was still in the bc era like no 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 ad era no no I, i'm thinking it was still before the 1800s that's what i'm thinking because you see a lot of this stuff we're talking 1300s some of the stuff actually was down um like i think some of this was down down to the what we would call a uh, 10 bc era or the the era of the 10 years before and after the potential switch from bc to ad and these are where a lot of these really awesome types of encryptions come from but this one right here changed everything this is what changed us from old style to new style and something i do want to point out is essentially all ciphers remained vulnerable to this technique of frequent analysis and to this day that's still true um the development of the polyphatic cipher and many remained so after so this polyaphic this polyalphic cipher it's hard for me to say it's basically the alphabetic cipher the cipher using vowels and consonants um like was the set in stone way to do ciphering from this point on it was the way to like it was it like you see here it is the this is the father of western cryptography because this guy right here because this the cipher system was invented by this guy right here around 1467 ad is when like you could basically say this is like for sure ready and we can say at the same time this is when the vinegar cipher came around so a lot of the ciphers that we're talking about right now you're probably thinking wow these are some strange names bro but to be honest people who mess with cryptography or anything like that or as you start going into your your hashing system and your privacy systems you're going to see this kind of stuff come up and really what all this shows is that people for a long time cared about privacy this is really what it means is that for a long time privacy had some kind of importance and the way of doing ciphering and encryption it really made a huge difference in if it was going to be successful because from this point on ever since approximately 1467 ad there has not been one type of vowel based cryptography that can exist that this book cannot decipher if it yeah sure it might have to go from one language to another language to get it into the setup to where it can decipher it but it can decipher it and even to this day that's pretty unique that's a skill set we don't see anymore being able to future proof cracking ciphers that's what's up so now that we're talking about cracking ciphers let's actually talk about failures so a lot of times when i talk about breaking an encryption i'm not talking about encryption failure i'm talking about a encryption crack a way of you know bypassing whatever math you actually did to not get me in um so failures is when for some reason it does not work no more like the system fails not just you break this person's password or something no the the, the encryption fails this has an entire website around just the ideal of teaching people why these things work so i want to show you this now i didn't give you the wikipedia for the previous one because that one's pretty easy to find but this page you might want to see this bro so here is the q oh whoa it did not pop up on screen give me three seconds there we go i had a i just had to change permission real fast my bad bro all right yeah so it was not showing you the qr so this page though um this is like the ub security page this is huge this is like a really big security informational website like for tech 
experts. And here they are, the guidance on, um, you know, basically management and stuff like that, what they recommend on how to handle to prevent failures of encryption, because that's going to be a big part of today. Um, I want to apologize. I keep seeing my face is doing these extra. I got a lot of these um, settings reconfigured, so it's starting to do more of my facial expressions. But now they're going haywire, like, hey, bro, let's go straight crazy on the facial. Um, but anyways, so if we see if we we classify how we sort our data, basically we want to put the more uh, secure data in the middle. Basically, you want to put the less secure data outside. And they really recommend not putting in data you don't want secure. If it's not needed to be secure, why secure it? And that's the very next thing. Do not secure unnecessary data. This actually complicates things. They'd rather have randomized information instead. And this is where tokenization comes into play. Tokenization is a big part in why we have what we have today in the digital space. Um, and you can see that the, like, there's even different types of format prevent, uh, preserving encryptions. There are types of format prevention encryptions. There are formats that prevent encryptions from being performed. There are formats that help encryptions being performed. There's tons of different things that have been developed to kind of help ensure that that book, that, that algorithmic book still exists and works to this day. But at the same time, so do our security keys, so do our hashing, so do our, so does the math that we're performing to hide data. And so make sure to encrypt all sensitive data at rest. This is kind of important. Like we can encrypt data at any point in time in the encryption phrase. Encrypting it at rest though, gives us clear points in a process. It's like, bro, every time you put the spoon down when you're cooking today, I want you to, to eat a grape. And by the time you get done with those grapes, that will tell me how many actions you did, right? Well, if I only do the encryption at rest, I only have to tell you how many times I rested. Like, I can reduce the amount of time, amount of information I have to tell you. Before, I don't have to tell you, oh, I did this process on this step and then this. Now it's just, bro, five rest. Five R, you're good, bro. And that, now I don't have to tell you a whole lot. I just tell you how many times I rest. And that's the point of this. Simplify your encryption. The more simple it is, the harder it will be to break. And that was the whole point of that book. That book took all the most complicated encryptions with vowels and simplified the keys. Simplified them. And this is what this is what quantum machines do to our cryptography. This is the scary side of cryptography. But we'll be getting into what we call quantum proofing in a second. So ensure you're up to date on standard systems like this. They actually have, you see, specified web portals. They have block cipher modes. Make sure your keys are set specific ways because some of these keys are already broken. AES keys are already broken. RSA keys are already broken, which is why you're seeing stuff on here 256 bit only with a 2048 plus bit key with a SHA-256 plus. When they say plus, um, bro, they means that it's with this or higher, with this and another. So th that's the keyword here. So when you see this 2,148, they're meaning they're wanting another set of valuable by eight or any kind of number set that's divisible by eight. Um, and then they're wanting a SHA-256 or 512 or so on and so on and so on, or a SHA-256 plus another SHA-256 or another SHA-512 or so on and so on. And these you see these combinations of encryptions. As one encryption fails, we combine them with the other ones to remake them good. And this was something that that scroll kind of taught us. Like that scroll, that one on the on the rod. There are ways. Eventually, they figured out they could just cram pack tons of data on there, even fake data. And if you had the wrong size rod, you might get the wrong data or just slightly incorrect data. So instead of going west, you might go east. You might be in the same general location, but you just went the wrong direction. And back in those types of times where we're talking Roman age and medieval times, that's a huge difference. That's like, you know, finding the ocean and finding the mountains. Um, so all these different little things made a huge difference. And to this day, they still do. So I think if you're getting anything out of here, keep in mind everything from original cryptography, we still do to this day in some form. Rather, it's been changed or directly the same. 
Um, even that one with the dowel rod, there is an actual type of mathematical encryption where they just use a mathematical dowel rod, where a rod is just a bit of uh, extra math or an actual number. And then with that, you basically can have the original encryption that was ever made still being used to this day. And if you use, um, I think it's base 58, that's technically the dowel rod encryption. So encrypt data in a transit to with this secure protocol. So you don't want to encrypt the wrong data the wrong way. For example, remember earlier, what was that rod used for? It was used for information getting to generals or someone on the battle. It was need to know quick, fast access information. But if we went back into that book, it was more long-term data, something that might have been stored for 50 years, 100 years, thousands of years. And that's the difference there. So they weren't using something for long-term storage in a short-term storage factor, and they're not doing it vice versa, which means how you store your data is important. Uh, disable caching for you know sensitive data, um, that just means that there's not duplications of data points. Apply So some of this you can see, it starts getting the more factors that doesn't matter. But I think the ones that we've talked about were the most important ones to really keep on. Besides stuff like key should be generated cryptographically, randomly, and without you choosing your bit arrays. So I wanted to point this out because there's a lot of like hardware wallets and software wallets and cryptography wallets because there are other ways to use cryptography than just crypto, uh, you know, currency. Um, and they allow you to pick your bytes. Flip a coin, zero, one. Pick, flip a coin, zero, one. Believe it or not, that's still picking your bytes. Roll a dice, zero to 20. Roll a dice, zero to 10. Roll a dice, zero to six. Roll it, you know, that you're not picking you're now more randomizing. So whenever you see those ones where they're like, just flip a coin to them six times, that's technically not the right way to go. Sure, at the end of the day, you still end up putting everything back into a byte form of ends up 256. But if you have an overflow, and now you don't know even where inside that amount of information you unloaded, this data set sits, it is more random. This is why keys should be generated cryptographically randomly and stored as memory in byte arrays instead of you picking your bytes. A password, if used, should be converted to a key via an appropriate base key derivation function. Basically, use the same style of mathematical formula, but use it slightly different. So that way it is the same type of base math, but not the same type of math. So unlocking or unbreaking one doesn't automatically unbreak the other. You got to do a little bit more math to get there. So that's the only extra thing here we have in this entire page that is important. Because if you don't have your keys, you don't have your coins. But for all cryptography, it works that way. If you don't have your keys, you don't have your data. That could mean more than just your coins. In some cases, that might be your birth certificate. That might be your social security card. It might be, you know, how you log into your bank that day. So this is a Thales uh, group site. Like this is a group uh, website for helping people with technically encryptions. <laughs> um, and this is about cryptography. And in this site, don't lose your encryption keys. And they specifically point out Bitcoin. Um, because according to the New Yorker, on December 13th, 2021, nearly 20% of all the coins mined have been lost 12 years after their inception. That's true. That means their keys got lost. And the magazine also illustrated with a story, which was originally released a few years ago, about a man who dumped their hard drive or hard disk into the trash, um, which then later found out it was the one that stored Bitcoin keys. And in 2017, it was worth $550 million. And he started going to that landfill and looking for his computer. And from my understanding, he's still looking for that computer. Um, and now that worth is way more than $55 million. It, his, that worth of that computer is probably in the billions now. Because that was at uh, $19,000 for Bitcoin. Um so you can actually now figure out how many Bitcoins he has. So 20 major encryption algorithms and their creation date. I think this is super important because when we talked about encryptions, 
you're going to realize we're really talking about stuff that's old. So here's a list of 20. Uh, the names are not really going to matter to you, and that's fine. So don't get too trippy on the names. Some of these names are kind of fun. Triple DES, 1974. Daifel Heinemann. That's actually people's names. 1976. RSA, 1977. Probably one of the most used encryptions on the internet. Uh, Skipjack, 1983. Also known as the famous Clipper Chip. Um, I think more people probably recognize Clipper Chip. Um, yeah. So then Elgamil, 1985. Uh, Shalakal, 2. 1998, which, believe it or not, Shalkal, I believe, is also used in a programming language called CAL, C-A-L. It's a calculus programming language. So Advanced Encryption Standard, AES, 1997, the other most used encryption on the internet. Blowfish, 1993. Toothfish, 1998. PGP, 1991. DSA, 1991. ECC, the elliptical curve cryptography, 1985, which is the one we use to make keys to this day. This is the most common way to make uh, cryptography keys. IDEA, 1990. RC4, 1987. Camellia, 2000. Surfant, 98. Mars, 97. 128, 98. Cast 5 is 96, and IARA is 03. You guys notice the most recent encryption here is IARA? And IRA is, from my understanding, used in very specific systems, and that's about it. Most of the encryptions that we use in the internet are older than me. They're older than most people probably watching this, or ever going to watch this. And that's scary. Why do we not have newer encryptions? Um, and it's because that there's a lot of reasoning for needing um, security. There's a lot of reasons for needing privacy. There's a lot of reasons for needing to hide data. Don't let everyone fool you for some reason. There is a reason to have this stuff. And look at this. Scientists cannot guarantee encryption beyond 30 years. It used to be scientists cannot guarantee encryption beyond 100 years. Now we're down to 30. Within the next 20 years, we're talking we might be able to go down encryption to beyond six months scary that's when tokenization comes in remember earlier we we're talking about tokenization all the way back on like i don't know 1780 they were talking about tokenization and we thought tokenization was new no tokenization is actually the process of replacing sensitive data with non-sensitive data that's kind of the same um for example remember we were talking about earlier go east or west what if the only thing you gave them was an e Oh, that's it. Bro, go E. Most people nowadays actually don't understand that'd be East. A lot of people who've ever looked at a map would go, oh, E, East. Back then, an E could have been anything. Bro, an E could have been its own language. No joke. So, tokenization became really important even back then, where instead of saying, take your highest army, I might just say, take your best boy. Take your best bro, yo. Something simple. Now, actually, back then, it probably would have, you know, been some other language, but something that I would say, instead of going, bro, take the best you got, I might just say, take your ace. People understand. Ace in the hole is a type of terminology used in business, meaning put your best people in your best places. So, tokenization is a huge difference. And when we talk about tokenization in the digital world, it's the same thing. When you send out that capture and you're sending that NFT, that non-functional token, it's actually tokenized information about something you did or something about you, which then gives us the difference between what is considered tokenized and encryption. So when we tokenize something for an encryption, it can allow us to then more securely send information. And this is kind of the point. Increase security, reduce the cost, no need to maintain a database if, well, you're not actually sending information that needs to be in a database. So you're just sending information that can be relatable to the person receiving it. And then we can have a little bit more flexible and more new ways to deploy inf applications. There's actually now a way, there is actually an API structure, a belt, around sending all possible data through hashings. And hash API that is standard around the cryptography hashing uh, standards. Something that's never been done before and something that's really cool to see because now we can actually natively transfer large chunks of information 
fully encoded, ready for internet through the internet that without actually sending most of it. It's insane. I can send you a bunch of data without sending you most of it. This is why we have more flexible systems thanks to tokenization with encryptions. We can also reduce the legal liabilities for breaches. And that's, I think, the most important part here. If you're securing your data, you might want to get rid of legal liability. And if you're not legal, if you're not encrypting specific data that might hold you legally liable, but in a way you're telling the person in a manageable way that they can understand what's up, you get your point done. And this really teaches us new things like how to be more generic in our life or our systems and still get our point across. How can that computer understand a little bit more than what me and you can understand because the computer has a little bit more than what me and you might have. And this is a huge difference. Now on this site, if you want to go into more about this, if you're really liking this, I'm going to point this out one more time because this site is super fun. It's if teens and up is what this site is intended for. But also keep in mind, some of the top researchers and technologists people come here as well. So not only is it good information, it's reliable information. And look, Khan Academy. I know. I love them. Okay, we're going to keep going. We're going to talk about this. We're gonna, okay, okay, okay. So basically, we're now we're just going a little bit over a little bit of history. We're in the Abra Kantanica. Actually, I can't say that word. I'm not even going to try. But um, this is just about encryption. So the only thing I really wanted to show you here is this. A lot of times when we... Oh, Oh, thank you. It, it was just readjusted. So a lot of times when we talk about these things, you guys kind of might not know what I'm going to hear. Like rest? Steps? Purple? So this is what we're talking about. If we look, we have an input. Okay. You need to know what that is. Then we have an original or initial um, permutation. Okay. So we're just basically doing some math. Then we take that input and we separate it. Okay. Our base and our remainder. Okay. All right. And then we're putting in randomized information here. We're actually, we're doing a math equation, put it there, which then is also part of this information. So this goes in here, then here with, with this same F. Then we apply that with plus whatever that is, which is going to be like one of the Shaw steps. And with this information as well at the same time, so this is tokenized data put inside with here. And if you see, this input gets put into here while this one is in. So as you can see, we are caching data. We are putting a duplication of data on one side and the actual data we want on the other. And then we are slowly making it more complicated. And that's the point here. And then when you see like these dotted lines, that's a, uh, eh, maybe. But it also means could continue on could go on further for any number of noun of times. In this case, this one up to 16 number of times. So between here and here, there's about 14 times in this process. Okay, so we can see this is just used to say skip ahead. Um, if it had a zero or a negative, then that would actually mean that it, that's the end. That's the last process would have been, if it's a zero, this would be the last process. If it's a negative, that's not the last, no, this one, process you wouldn't go through. This would be like an additional possible process. But since there's an n, we know it's a nth number of times or unknown number. And if we look to 16, 14 is the difference. Then we have a pre-output and then we redo the original math. We reverse it and we have an output. So we don't even know what was actually encrypted. And that's the point. This is the main SHA system. This is kind of how it works. The best way to look at it. And I think it's a really nice visual of what you're getting. So, let's talk about some ciphers. Let's talk about cracking the encryption. Because cracking the encryption, remember we, we, we mentioned now, you know what a failure is. It's actually completely destroying the system in its entirety. Cracking encryption is just, well... Figuring out the math. Basically, getting around the math in some way. Um, oftentimes, you figure out one piece of it, and then you just brute force your way through. And when we go through here, we're going to see a lot of examples. I'm not going to really be explaining everything. 
Um, I just kind of want you to get the visuals of what we're talking about. Caesar cipher, as you see, is just shifting stuff. If X is here, it goes to A, then A goes to D. We kind of know what that is. A, if it originally equaled 1, and now equals 4, and so on and so on. And we can see that it loops back, so the end comes back to the beginning, takes up the spaces from the beginning that are, you know, empty. So if we have this, we now have this. None of the data is repeated. All the data is still there. So if we have this, we now have this. None of the data is repeated. All the data is still there. Here we go. I mean, this is a vinegar. I'm sure I'm saying the name wrong because it's a French name. I don't speak French. Sorry. Someone please correct me in the, the chat. Um, and you might think, hey, kind of looks like a crossword puzzle. Yeah. This kind of looks like a math grid, like I'm about to do some math. And that's exactly what you're doing. It's a math grid. It is a what we would call a lookup table. So you have uh, data on the left and the top for lookup. And you cross, go across. So you would know like H, J, N, Z. And so we have two sets of data to encrypt one letter. And that letter could be anything. But at the same time, it will still be within this data point set, which means it can be brute forced. So we can see, again, nothing is really duplicated, but it's all there. But this time we do have a set of duplication data that is kind of pointless. Understood. Well, there's the kind of pointless data there. But understood. So now we're seeing keys. Now we're seeing a reduction of the same kind of concept. Now this looks more like a crossword puzzle. Okay, I see price. I see digits. I see... Okay, so, but no. It is still basically the same thing. Like we know that we start at one letter and then we basically just do math keep going and you see here um if both letters in the diagram are the same add an x after the first letter and split them as this new diagram and continue encoding the message and then you end up with something kind of like this all right and as you keep going through these different things you'll see they come out different ways and we can go okay this is a key this must be the data uh this is the data this must be the key or these points are the key this must be the data and so we have various different ways that we can see things. Various different ways we can then set the keys and the parameters. And and that's all this is. These are different types of encryptions. You can see most of these encryptions are based on some visual. And that's kind of important. Rail fence cipher is basically the same thing as that tube. That tube cipher. This is basically the same thing. This is what I was talking about earlier when I say we have a type of cipher that still uses that original. This is it. And you can see this one, it looks kind of weird and strange. And all these little dots would be other possible letters. And then we just know to go through one specific rel or to go on certain points for certain rels. And it can be simple as this. And you where you give them all the data, but on anything that's duplicated. You got to figure it out. And you see, there is a mathematical determinable way to do all this. It has to kind of the point. We use the math with a visual aid with our words or letters to do something. We're not just doing one or the other, we're doing a combination. Because, again, that's what the point of all this is it's about combining things to make something new. So, as we keep going, we see Book Cipher. Um, book Cipher is not the same as we saw earlier. That's where it was a decryptor or a key here it'd be like using words in a book so page 39 verse 7 or word 7 like this page 39 paragraph 7 word 12 page 39 paragraph 7 word 12 that specific word is blah blah, blah. um and we keep going you're gonna get more and more but some of these they get a little bit more fun to look at you might have seen some of these in some video games like this one is in a bunch of video games um but if you want to come in here and see some more, they have other fun things to look at. But these are some, just to show you that a lot of encryptions are visual cue with words and math. So how do we solve these things? Like, what are the 10 toughest ones to solve? 
And if you want some challenge or some fun or even to learn how some of these have been solved, let's go. Let's go. Let me see. Let me get this page for you. This is Skyscape. Now, this is more of a a, a, a non-techie person, right? This is a more of a regular person uh, website. Um, there we go. Here's that QR for you. So what this will allow you to do is like, when you go through here and you see how some of these have been deciphered or uh, figured out, you'll see that some of the unique ways people had to go through different things to figure stuff out. For example, this is an archaeological find um, made around 1700 to 1600 BC, and it's considered one of the most controversial inscriptions within the world of code and ciphers. Basically, we're not sure if we've uh, if it's been cracked correctly. It, it could it really have been cracked by an archaeologist in 2022? They're not sure. Um, but even the guy who says he's cracked it still says he's still only 99% there, and he's not even sure if it's done right. So even ciphers and encryptions that are older than us are really uncrackable. Some of the hardest uncrackable things are super old. And that's the reason why it's uncrackable. The knowledge of uncracking it has been lost. This is why we have a lot more encryptions now where we don't actually have to give information to each other. It can be decrypted on its own. Because we learned that from the old stuff. They did that. How did they do that? That's what we're still trying to figure out. Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes, and the Dancing Men Cipher. Given Sherlock Holmes loved the encrypt messages buried in the Times Agony Column, it was perhaps inevitable that the stir author Colin Doyle would invent his own secret alphabet in the adventure of the Dancing Men. Can you solve the Colin Doyle's uh, substitution cipher? So this is substituting characters for letters, basically. Cool. China's Yun Dynasty coin inscriptions. Now, this might have a lot of people kind of going, whoa, coin inscriptions? Wait a minute, Bitcoin coin inscriptions? Yeah. Actually, why are you not using your Bitcoin coin inscriptions to inscribe, like, I don't know, a proof of stake third party second layer system built inside the core of Bitcoin? Wait a minute. You can do something like that? Chinese Yin, the Chinese dynasty figured out how to do something like that. I know it's not quite what we're talking about, but they actually figured a way to insert heritage secret information into coins then they could actually give people who are ancestors these coins without telling them any information and then when they make their way back to certain places people who understand the, the history of these coins would be able to read these coins and would be able to understand you're an important figure you're an important person or maybe you're the son of or the daughter of someone who is important nowadays though there are some of these we don't have a clue what they mean and that is really cool because now, not only are they offering prizes for people who can figure out what these etchings actually do mean, but maybe we can take this and use it in some Bitcoin inscriptions, maybe some new NFT type stuff, something that might catch your fancy for something a little bit different. But if you know anything, Slumberton Man is very similar to another one that we're also going to cover very quickly. Summerton Man is an Australian murder mystery cryptic twist. Um, this was uh, basically, yeah, 1948. Um, the well-dressed man found on Albert Brink slumped against a seawall in 1948, carried no ID, his clothing labels were removed, his pockets were ripped, and were, no, his pockets held only a single ripped piece of paper torn from a poetry book, the Rublet. Of, at Omar Khayyam, which I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, with the Persian words Tanam Shud, which means it is finished. The book itself revealed another clue, a handwritten message or code that has never been deciphered. The So the where the page was ripped from, basically the book the page was ripped from, the corner of the suspected stomach on men was poisoned. But couldn't be certain. Australian hopes DNA tests was going to help, and they actually exhumed his body in 2021 to do some of these tests. Um, hence, there are none. A few curious coincidences: the code written um, inside the book uh, was not found at the crime scene. John Freeman, a chemist, later handed the book over to the police. Its pages also revealed a phone number for Jesse Thompson, a nurse who claimed she did not know Somerton Man. Um, 
so they think and this is probably like a ruse or a setup or something it might not be anything but at the same time it's too much like something else for them to just ignore it which we'll go over shortly so the mit cryptic time lock puzzle this kind of became like the reason why everyone was doing a bunch of these time lock saves and stuff is because the time lock puzzle got cracked in 99 or made in 99 and it basically was just a puzzle to figure out if you could break this rsa algorithm and to be honest uh it was estimated to take 35 years and it took a self-taught belgian programmer 15 years to actually do it well no i said that wrong to do it 15 years early we don't know how long he actually took to do it but on his own a self-taught coder took did it 15 years early um and that yeah and people were doing that like crazy because they were like oh well we know it can be opened even if we don't know the code in you know 10 years 15 years someone can open it and that's why a lot of people started doing it um i know like a lot of schools did it and stuff you probably saw it in tv and stuff but there was this guy um mr uh what was it edward elder or whatever um he encrypted something to a person and didn't tell anybody how to solve it so something like this happens all the time the only thing we know is it's 24 symbols um consisting of one or two or three semicircles and in one of eight directions and that's how we know it's a cipher 24 one two three eight i don't know if you know this but 24 and 8 is the most key point here there and one two and three just lets us know key positions and trilateral systems are in threes and 24, I believe, being a type of non-prime, and 8 being a non-prime. Let's us know that there's primes hidden inside um, the manuscript. So you're noticing a lot of these are like books. A lot of these are text. A lot of these are just stuff. Like like I said, books, the code book. Um, oh, they didn't go over. I think it's another page. But the big thing here is this. So there was another murderer that did basically the exact same thing. Ah, I don't have it up here. I thought I had it up here. Dang it. Um, yeah. But basically, this is very close and similar to the American um, murder cipher thing. And that's why they think it's serious. But at the same time, that type of cipher still hasn't been solved even the one that we have in america the same one has been solved and so they think that might be a key to future future encryptions because they're unsolvable even to this day even with all the information that we have so i'm wanting to give you guys this site i'm not going to actually go over i think i don't have anything highlighted on the site um i just wanted to give you this site because it gives you these different types of like cryptography type so you can kind of get an idea of different types of cryptography the only thing i really wanted to point out here is post quantum cryptography and public key cryptography so we're at public key cryptography this is where we're at right now this is bitcoin cryptocurrency all that fun stuff post quantum cryptography is what we're working on this when i say working on is a weird statement to say the least um, and so, you know, the people that came up the site, actually really good cryptography researchers. And um, this guy right here, I believe, actually invented the cryptography type on its own, like an entire type of cryptography. Beautiful genius. Um, but lattice space encryption, this is post quantum cryptography. Now, it's not true post, not yet. They believe it will become very quickly and the more people learn about it the more cryptography people that get up on on this the faster it grows it's actually increasing in complication and ability almost as fast as how ai is developing so it's very quickly now this system a lot of the stuff was invented in like 1999 but the original ideal of the system was invented in 1996 this is insane. So post-quantum cryptography was invented in 1996. And what is it? Well, it's actually more on the visual cue than some of the other ones we've had in the past. Um, 
and imagine a honeycomb or a set of books. And the best way I like to explain it is imagine a set of books. You are not told which book you can grab, but you are told to start in a specific position and that the book is either one or three spaces away from the next choice you make. You can also only make choices of one or three away. You can either go positive, which is to your right, or negative, which is to your left. And you start dead center. When you find the book, you then have to repeat this entire process to get to the right page. To repeat this entire process to get to the right word. And that word is going to be the key to unlock the encryption. Okay, so in this case, that word is going to be the word to come to me to say for me to hand you whatever amount of money I'm trying to hand you. That is what this is. All right, so they explain it as a lattice. When you make a lattice, you have a pieces of wood that you have to, you know, layer. A lot of people, they, they nowadays you see them where it's one layer is one way, one direction. The second layer on top of it's another direction. But traditionally, they are like woven. And the way you wave, weave lattice is very specific. It's the same way we do this math, very specifically, going one step forward, two steps back to solve, but to wrap, it's two steps forward, one step back. So if I want to unwrap the lattice, I have to go two steps backwards, one step forward, over and over and over and over. And then to rewrap it, I would go the same steps I did, in reverse, one step forward, two steps. I mean, one step backwards, two steps forward. And it would put itself back together in the same way I took it apart. No matter how the lattice was put together. Same thing here. No matter how we put the lattice together, any way visual cue, we take it apart in a similar manner. One step back, two step forward, or two step back. And the steps forward and back are based on something other than simply forward and back. It's based on how far into the degree it is and is it positive or negative? You see here, a big lattice is really any kind of randomized number set. Square, it's 90 degree. Rectangular is also 90 degree, but with a non-equivalable A to B. Um, hexagonal is at 120. And then rhombic is basically the first one, but purely equal. Well, the first one, the oblique, was, had a non-equal A to B. So we see just changing one slight action to one of these two things is A and B equal, or what's the degree, and we have a completely different type of lattice. So now we can even adjust the lattice on the fly, allowing us to have a new combination of things. How do you actually do a lattice? That's what this page is for. If you actually think this is cool, which I know some of you out there are at least going to go, this sounds neat. Well, believe it or not, there is a kind of fun way to solve these. There's actually a way to solve these that if you learn this equation, it'll help you solve puzzles, like physical puzzles. If you have a thousand piece puzzle or more, this method works. And you start in the middle, start in the middle. You start with one piece and you work your way around by trying other pieces. And you're not trying like up, down, left, right. You're trying angle pieces. So you're not even fitting them all together until you start getting pieces that go in between these two pieces, which then if they work, you know you have a correct set. So then once you have one set, you just keep building on from that set. But which set you build, you don't know. You just get four pieces, and then you get four pieces, then you get four pieces until you get a set that works within the side of it. So every time you get a piece, you'll go try, 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 and all the little pieces in between. Don't work. Find a piece on the corners to set it, like one of these little sets here. You get a new piece, try them all, all in between, doesn't fit anywhere, go all on the outside. Eventually, you'll get one piece that will fit somewhere, and it will cause this cascading effect where now you try all the ones around that to see if any more fit in there. And then they will, and then more, and then more. And then you get to a point where you started with one piece, and then you ended up just going around in a weird shape of, you know, normally a spiral when it comes to a physical puzzle, but sometimes nowadays, the way puzzles are cut, it will be in a space filling way so i'll show you that in a second but what i'm really getting at is this lattice system works in 
actual puzzles. It works in other things than just this encryption, which means it's not purely based on just fake math. It's based on real physical mathematical systems, even if we don't understand what that is. Here's more proof of it. What happens when you take this math and you run it through a 3D printer? Well, we take the math and we get this. If we're doing the ones where A and B is equal. If we did ones where A and B is not equal, we get the other one, the random. And as you can see, we have basically the same output, but well, random takes a lot more to get there. If we look at total edges, random takes more to get there. Number of edges, random took more to get there. Number of nodes, random took more to get there. Key point here is the random takes longer than knowing the actual weight. And that's the point of lattice. Lattice can allow you to make it more difficult with this randomization, where now instead of it being like this slight difference, it'd be double, triple, quadruple more different to get to the same output. So even if you're just fighting the clock, the person with the actual output will always win. So what kind of lattices do we have? What kind of future proofing can we get? Well, here are different 3D lattices. And I'm using these ones specifically because I believe, my honest opinion, these are going to be the ones that work. Because so far, all the ones that do work have a 3D printable vector. And that's in a key point here. These are all different types of lattice point vectors. There's some kind of start, and it vectors out and expands out with new points and vectoring and splitting and branching and becoming this unique shape. So Voroni, it's a type of mathematical situation where we use a randomized output of one to three to get the next how many branches and then also in which percentage of, of um, degree are they going to be based off the first one and you end up with this crazy output and as you see the end output is a cube every time how far it has to get to that cube how big it has to get to make that cube that's the difference here the bigger that cube has to be for it to come to a cube the harder it is to break the longer it is to break ah so now we have a way to determine time with these 3D modeling displays. Same thing with this one, this Dulani. Now this Dulani lattice, it's basically got no internal. It is a single set structure. This is like a one-time password being sent, bro. This is a one-time password being sent. There's only one way to get the output. But once you get that output, it's pretty fast to get. Then we have like surface space, uh, gyroid. I'm not saying that right at all. This one's kind of cool. It stands up on its own doesn't have any actual output but we can see is a square we can see the data but we can't see what's in it this will allow us this type of lattice encryption can actually allow us to encrypt data without encrypting the data but tokenize in a new way imagine tokenizing with your encryption instead of tokenizing before you encrypt that's what we're talking about herbert space filling curve now this is the one i was talking about earlier when i said space filling you might notice that that looks kind of familiar. It's definitely a square, but all the space inside is filled. And that's the difference here, is that it takes all of the points to make the end. Nice. So when we go, future-proofing can be way more um, flexible. It can be The newer hashing is a lot more flexible. And I want to show you this, because unless you grew up like in the 98, 2000s, or anything like that, you might not know what this is. This is a screensaver. This is that Herbert space filling math being performed as a screensaver. And by the time it gets done, the whole thing is filled. And when the whole thing is filled, the computer just resets the screen and does it again. This math equation was originally invented to determine how much data could be stored inside of a hard drive or inside of a box. And some of that data is based on this mathematical way of solving math. So you, I don't know if, if anybody knows what lattice multiplication is. In America, they call it something else. I think it's got a really weird name in America. Um, Cross-hatching math, I think some people call it or whatever. They got it. It's just a, 
a way of like you go from here to here. So instead of taking like 28 times 15, I just go 2 times 1. Okay, so 10s, non 10s, 8 times 1, 2 times 5, 10, 8 times, and then this would be remainder, 8 times 5, 4, and then we just add them up this way, and then we get our, and then we just go boom. Okay, so your answer is what, 42? Okay, cool. So that's where this lattice style comes in hand. This is where the space filling curve comes from. This is a very important part of the math because now we have a visual way to determine the math. All the other ways we were looking at the math, there was no visual. There's a visual for the encryption, but not a visual for the math. Now we have a visual for the math and a visual for the encryption, which means the math can get way more complicated. And this is the point of future proofing. This is the point. And I want to point something out because everyone, I know a lot of people in America are freaking out. They're like, oh no, this is the new way to do math. This math was invented during the 12th century and pretty much perfected during 1450 AD. This math is older than the math that we perform right now. And this is considered new. So, let's get to some fun. So, what's the point of knowing all this if you can't use it for anything? Well, if you paid attention today, you might actually be able to crack the a number-based lock for someone's bike. Or, you know, like one of the, like, four sets or six sets of numbers where you just got to figure it out. Now you might know a, a little bit easier way to start in the middle. Everyone starts at the beginning and works their way from either left to right or right to left. Now you know, based off of the lattice, start in the middle and work your way out. And believe it or not, when you do it that way, uh, when you jiggle the lock, if the middle ones are, are set, it will jiggle more and more as you get more of them set. And then as you get the very end one set, it releases. Very fun. Um, so I just wanted to try to show you guys, like, what are these different encryptions? And we're... we're Talking about the longest encryption key ever. I thought there was a picture in here to show some of that, but I'm not seeing it. Um, I guess this is the only thing they have here. But basically, scientists have set a record by extending the longest cracked encryption from 232 digits to 240. I want to keep pointing out, right now, uh, Bitcoin encryption is 256 digits. Mm -hmm. No, actually, no, I'm wrong. 256 bytes, which is... Take that times one point was it two point one four, and that's about how many digits are inside of it. It's almost double or a little over double. Sometimes a little under double based on uh, which shot you're on. Where two fifty if they're Bitcoin, it's a little over double. Um, some of the newer encryptions that we use, it's a little under double. But so we're almost at the point where they're able to actually crack these extremely long long hashes. These very complex encryptions. And now keep keep in mind, this is the most complex encryption key ever cracked. Not the most complex ever to exist. Just the most complex ever cracked. I want to point that out. Because this isn't failure. This is cracking. We spent a long time today talking about how these systems, these methods, all this stuff can fail. It can break. It can be cracked. What this really means is our encryptions are old, ancient technology, still being used to this day by the ancestors of the creators of these makers. And we still find valuable need in making sure this technology exists and works. We find valuable need in making sure that we can continue on this, this heritage of hiding information as needed. To have privacy and security. But at the same time, we haven't need to break it. We have to. We have to break the things we make. Or else someone else will break it without us knowing it. And then we're screwed. So, I really hope today what you guys get. What I wanted to change your perspective of. Encryption is not new. It's the oldest thing we have. It is almost as old as the written language. And in some cases, 
the written language helped start the modern cryptography we have to this day. And you can thank the Greeks and the Romans for figuring out the best way to do keys, because we still to this day use a similar method for making keys for encryptions. And that's just something that you don't see in history books. This is something you only see in the internet history. All right, thank you guys for showing up today. I really hope you enjoyed today's episode. I hope I change your perspective on how old encryptions really are and what they can be used for. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. Have a great day.